Good Sunday morning, good Easter Sunday morning. And of course, the response is, he is risen. And then you say, he is risen indeed. That is where we are today. And by the way, in case you missed it, we've already been live once this morning, already had a great message outside. This is really the second part of the message in a way. But if you missed this morning, it's okay. I mean, you can go back and look at that later. But they build right off of each other. I told you, if you were with us Friday, I said between Friday, sunrise, and then this message that we've got today, it all just flows together to give us this picture. And as I said this morning, it's all designed to give us hope. Something that we really desperately need in our world today. And I'm just going to kind of build on that hope. But continuing also what we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks, the case for Easter. What is the evidence that we have that these events are real and true and we can hang on to these things? I'll give you more of that as we progress in the story today. But the first order of business always when we come online is I want to know who's here, who's watching, who's on the other side of the camera. Use the chat box in YouTube and Facebook, and I guess on Instagram. Can, is there a chat box on Instagram? Can they chat? I don't know how that works. Instagram, if you're there, you can, you can let us know that. But we also have that 800 number you see on the screen down there. That's always available for text, 888-2430-827. That's our main way to communicate. You can text anytime, day or night. We get notified about that. So... Be a part of the discussion as we begin. I, I've said this you know, f since we started this. This is like when we throw open the doors of the church and we're kind of greeting everybody for the first couple of minutes. It's great to know who's here and where you're watching from in the world and all of that. And of course, helping us do that is my beautiful wife, our digital host. Here she is, everyone, clapping emojis. Good morning. If it was Friday morning, I was, sorry, if it was Friday night, I would do the clapping, but we won't do the clapping, I know. It was good this morning. It was. I'm just glad to be in the home, in the house because it's warm. Yeah, it was very cold. <laughs> it was very just cold. so, in, in case you didn't know, you could actually see my breath. I don't know if you saw it on camera, but I think you could. He did because I think my yeah. dad mentioned that. <laughs> it really, that you could see your yeah, breath. <laughs> it was like 40 degrees, but we had had rain most of the night last night, so there's some humidity. It's a little damp and cold. And yes, we are glad to be in the house. We don't have our jackets <laughs> on. We're okay. Climate controlled. So here we are. You feel better? Yes. Did I'm your a lot toes warmer. warm up? She said her toes were numb. It was and that cold. My hands are cold. <laughs> she was wearing gloves in order to do. <laughs> it was cold. But okay, but so now. And Jim's checking in. Says happy Easter, everyone. From Jim Kelly and Kelly's mom, Sandra. Jim, Kelly, Sandra. Glad you made it. I don't know if you've been outside, but it's cold in the Vegas Valley where you guys are with us also. And then Barry Brown. I know him as Gus. Gus says happy <laughs> Easter, church. Happy Easter, Gus. We are glad you made it from Indiana. And then Aunt Chris is watching, says, good morning, everyone. Yes, he has risen indeed. Happy Easter. Love from AC and Lola in snowing and raining PVAZ this <laughs> wow. morning. And more to come. This is not springtime weather. <laughs> wow. Snowing and raining in Prescott Valley, Arizona. Aunt Chris, we're glad you made it back. She was on with us this morning and glad you made it. Hi, Aunt Chris. And then Jeannie's watching, says, happy Easter, everyone. Jeannie here. Jeannie, stay indoors. It's cold out there. <laughs> I know it's sunny, and it'll probably warm up a little bit, but it's still pretty cold today. I don't know why. And then Bill's watching, says, hello from Pahrump. Hey, Bill from over the hill in Pahrump. Bill, we are glad you made it on. Happy Easter. And then Mark's watching, says, happy Sunday from Albuquerque, New Mexico. From Albuquerque, New Mexico. Mark Solomon, we are glad you made it on with us. And what's it like in Albuquerque? Have you got cold days? Is it? I'm sure it's probably cold there too. Then my aunt says, "Love you, Peggy. I love you too, Aunt Chris." Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And what oh, else welcome we got? everybody from New Release today. Of course. Welcome to all of you on New Release today. He has risen. He has risen indeed. You could use that chat box. You are still part of the discussion if you're on New Release today with us. Well, this is awesome. We have two people from North Las Vegas watching. Nice. Danny's watching. Says, good morning, Danny and Taylor from North Las Vegas, which they've been They've been, been on before. before. I recognize the names. And then we have a new one, uh, Manny Williams. Happy Resurrection Sunday from Imani in North Las Vegas. We've got people right here, right in our own neighborhood. That is amazing. We are also technically North Las Vegas, but just to kind of give you the idea, we're sort of between the Air Force Base and the VA hospital. We're right in there. So just to give you an idea, if you know North Las Vegas, glad you guys could make it on this morning, this beautiful, yes, Resurrection Sunday. And then my dad's watching, says, great day in the Lord, PVAZ and Charlie. From Prescott Valley, Arizona, my father-in-law, her father, Gary, glad you made it on. 
Hi, Dad. <laughs> I got to talk to him this morning, too. Oh, very good. He said good. you did a very good message. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and he said you could see my breath, so. Yeah. <laughs> and then Jan's watching, says, Chuck, Dan, and Michael, wishing everyone happy Easter from Orange, California. It's 55 degrees and cloudy. In beautiful, sunny Southern California, although not sunny today. <laughs> Chuck and Jan and Michael, glad you guys made it on. And then Helen's watching, says, Happy Easter Sunday. Helen is watching from Tustin, 55 and cloudy. 55, cloudy and Tustin. Of course, we missed it. We always say, Wish we were there. Wish we were there <laughs> in Southern California. And then Jonna says, We're back, Maddie and Jonna, <laughs> in Newport Beach. I'm glad you guys made it back from Newport Beach, California. There we go. We've got the whole Southwest. We've got Arizona. We've got California. We've got New Mexico. Anybody from the East Coast? Have we seen anybody yet? They were on earlier this <laughs> yeah, morning. Yeah, we had some of our East Coasters on this morning. But. And Chris says, now it's sunny for a few minutes. Sunny for a few minutes. So you got all the weather happening in Prescott Valley. And then Mark says, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, it's 61 and sunny. Oh, well, that's kind of nice in Albuquerque. Thank you for sharing. And I think that was it. Okay. So just a reminder for those of you that are watching, she is there. She will be behind the screens during this time that we are on, about an hour or so. Questions, comments, all of that, she'll be right there. Could share that with me when we get done. But just so you know, we also do, and at the end I'll let you know, some other interactive Bible studies that we do throughout the week that's a little bit more interactive than what we do on Sunday. But for now... One last chance. I'm going through. I think that's it. <laughs> New release today. Yeah. Okay. So you go have a sit down and we will jump into it this morning. Uh, oh, um, just so we know, and you know, we, we always have our man in Belgium, Dietrich, and he's on with us often, but not this morning. He had to work. But this morning, we will have in just a moment the Dutch phrase of the day, except somebody's doing something technical right now that you can't see. But we'll put that up on the screen. The Dutch phrase of the day that goes along with, He is risen. And of course, we said, What is the response? He is risen indeed. And that is our Dutch phrase of the day. Is it up? Did you put the Dutch phrase? Okay, I can't see it. See, I don't know what's on. Dutch phrase of the day. He is risen indeed. He is voorlijk barizen. He is varlik varizen. He is risen indeed. And Dietrich, if you have the opportunity to watch this afterward, how did I do? I sound okay? All right. This morning, we began outdoors. We began out in our backyard with the sun rising behind me because the Bible says that these, this group of women went out to the tomb as the, the day was dawning on that first day of the week, that Sunday morning, the most important Sunday we could imagine, the day that the stone was rolled away, the day that the tomb was empty, the day that we've been building up to for the last couple of weeks. We've been in this series that we've been calling Case for Easter. And yes, I totally, you know, stole that from Case for Christ, Case for Faith, Lee Strobel. And of course, we thank him for that. But Case for Easter the idea is, how do we look at the events surrounding Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? How do we look at that and use that as really a catalyst for our understanding of the reality, the truth that we find in the pages of Scripture? We said as we've been going along, the first thing that we looked at was, why would anybody kill Jesus? In our world today, if you ask the average person outside of church, who is Jesus? They might give you an answer like, well, he was a great prophet, a great teacher. But then why did they try and kill him? If he was a great prophet, great teacher, what's, what's the problem? And we use some of the words of Jesus himself and find out that the reason they try to kill him is because he said things like he is the son of God, son of man. He made claims that were aligning himself with God. And that's going to get him in some trouble. We also said that part of our understanding, the reality of this is Jesus foretold his death, foretold his resurrection, fulfilled the prophecies. That'll even be part of what we're going to look at today. But all of that just kind of putting the stamp on it. Jesus is who he said he was. And he proved it by fulfilling the prophecies that were mentioned thousands of years before his birth. Then, as we're coming to this 
really important day. We said one of the examples we see is in the lives of his disciples who were forever changed because of this day, because of the resurrection, because Jesus, who was dead and is alive again, it changes something about him. So what we're going to do today, and we'll put the title up on the screen, we're calling this one Case for Easter, and this is not our final one. I'm going to continue this on next week, but Case for Easter, the tomb. We're going to read about just about 10 verses in the Gospel of John. And in those 10 verses, it says the tomb seven times. The tomb, the tomb, the tomb. Why is the tomb so important? We're going to take a look at that, and that's going to be part of our case for Easter this morning. But first, before we start any of that, let's begin it with a word of prayer. Father, we are thankful and grateful for all that you do and say. We are thankful and grateful for this incredible opportunity we have to go live and, and, and reach people here in our own area, in North Las Vegas, all the way around the southwest where we are this morning, oftentimes hitting people in different parts of the country and different parts of the world. I don't know where this message is going, where this is going to hit today, but you do. You do, Lord. You know. You know who needs to hear this. You know who maybe needs a little bit of hope today. You know who may need a little bit of this message of the resurrection, whose lives look hopeless, and they just need the hope that comes on this incredible day. As we say those words, He is risen. He is risen indeed. How certain are we? How certain are we of these events? I just pray that you give us a more firm foundation each and every time we look at this. You lead us. You guide us in the text today. You allow the stream just to keep flowing where it needs to go, wherever it needs to go today, from here in our valley just to the ends of the earth. Whoever needs this message today, you just take it to them. We are thankful and grateful for what you're doing, believing that nobody's going to join us by accident, that you've got something planned for us all. Speak to us through your word and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. Where we are going in the text this morning is John chapter 20, John's gospel chapter 20. Now, just to remind you where we were earlier this morning, we started in Matthew's gospel, and I'm looking at two different gospels on purpose because they, they change the story slightly. There's different things happening, and believe it or not, that's actually going to be one of the foundational ideas in this case for Easter. I'll get into that once we hear this. But what we saw this morning was the women heading to the tomb. And to put ourselves in their place this morning, we think about these women who all they know, they saw Jesus hanging on the cross. Mary Magdalene, we know, was there. These other women were there right up until the end. Can you imagine how horrifying it would have been to see Jesus, this Jesus that you have followed, this Jesus that you were just absolutely convinced was the Messiah of Israel. All of our hope is on this man. And there he is hanging on a cross, his life slowly ebbing and flowing out of him until he breathes his last. How do you feel? There is great sorrow. There's pain. There's confusion. We heard his teaching. He said so many things. He said so many hopeful things. We hoped he would be the one. And then he's gone. And we can't understand it. But did we forget, like I said, that Jesus told them? In Matthew's gospel, it even says that. He's not here. He is risen, just as he has told you. And then he gives them the instruction. And I said, the way out of hope for any one of us is a purpose, a plan, a mission. Not just any purpose, plan, or mission. Because God has this amazing way of taking my purpose, plan, and mission and shifting it for his glory, which is the Easter story. Now let's get into the text this morning and let's see where do we go from the empty tomb. Let's jump back into it. John chapter 20, starting verse 1. On the first day of the week, 
Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, and said to him, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've put, put him. At that, Peter and the other disciple went out, heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded in a separate place by itself. The other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, saw, and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. Okay, step two in this story. They were told by the angels. We heard that from Matthew's gospel. Go tell the disciples. What happens next in the story? They go tell the disciples. What do the disciples do? They run to the tomb. I mean, that's the natural reaction. You've got to be kidding me. Where's Jesus? He's not in the tomb. We saw him. We know that he had died. We know that. We maybe, and we don't know exactly who accompanied. We know Joseph of Arimathea, his mother. Who else would have been there? We don't know. Did any of the disciples actually go to the tomb? We don't know. All we could say is this group put Jesus in the tomb. They rolled the stone in place. We're told that the chief priest, the authority said, seal the tomb. And by the way, the, the way things work during Roman times, if you did something like seal a place off, the only one authorized to unseal it and open it is the one who put the seal and the one whose seal is on it. In this case, Pontius Pilate. The only one authorized to have that seal broken, Pontius Pilate. The only one that did roll away, we read that this morning, an angel and an earthquake. <laughs> what an amazing thing. What an amazing, powerful moment. But there's some slight differences to the story, and I hope you picked up on that if you were with us this morning. And if you've heard this story before, because by the way, all Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all have the story slightly different. Some people look at this and go, aha, because it says, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. Matthew's gospel says, as the day was dawning, Okay, that's a slight timing thing. That's not even a big deal, right? And then it says, she saw the stone had been removed from the tomb, so she went and ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And you go, wait, wait, wait. Okay, in the story that we read this morning, it's slightly different. It says Mary was there with some other ladies. We don't hear about the other ladies in this one. The angel spoke to them. We don't hear about the angel speaking to them. It sounds like a different story, yes and no. One of the things that you must understand, and one of the things that we would call the evidence in this case for Easter, how can you be sure that this story is true? Some people would point to that and go, aha, look, in fact, all four stories slightly different, but we remind ourselves that's actually a reason to believe it, not a reason to disbelieve it. Because, here's how it works, and by the way, this was confirmed to me by a friend of mine, some of you know, Pastor Andy, who used to be Officer Andy, he was a police officer, and he told me that's absolutely true, that when you are questioning a group of people about an event that occurred, some sort of crime was committed, I don't know, somebody stole a body or something, right? You talk to everybody, and if everybody is telling identically the same story with no changes in details, the story is made up. Think about it, okay? When the police get here, you're going to say this. Same thing, when the authorities get here, we're going to say this and this. If the disciples had stolen the body, as was the story that was made up, they would have had identically the same story, not sort of the same story. It would have been the same. So this little slight difference, this change in the story slightly, it really doesn't change the meaning of the story, but it actually serves to confirm the story is true and not made up. These little subtle differences. Like, 
if everybody said, okay, we were going to the tomb and it was day, it was slightly dark, day was dawning, these slight shifts in the time, that just helps us to believe the story even more. So what did happen? If we could piece this together based on all four gospel stories, and by the way, Nobody's completely sure, but I've read some different commentaries and different experts, and they say probably what we're dealing with is, yes, a group of ladies, Mary Magdalene was one of them. This event occurs with the angels. Now, John's writing his gospel later, and for whatever reason chooses not to talk about the angels, and that's not a problem, but then he also says, okay, Mary Magdalene probably took off first. She may not have even heard the story of the angels. That may have been the other women. Don't know. But just recognize, this morning we met, we read Matthew's gospel, and the angel said, he's not here, he has risen. Go tell the disciples. And we said their mission to anoint the body of Jesus is now shifted, and it's now time for them to go to this new mission, go and tell. That's their new mission. And then they see Jesus on the way. You don't hear about this. Maybe, like I said, Mary Magdalene took take off first and goes and gets the disciples. Okay, that's what happens next in the story. And that's what John is concerned about. She went, verse two, she went running to Simon Peter, to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. And by the way, if you've read John's gospel, you know, that's how he refers to himself. He refers to himself as the one who Jesus loved. Not like Jesus didn't love them all, but that's just how he identified himself. Some people say that he used that maybe as an act of humility. He didn't say, the one writing this letter is telling you this. Instead, he just sort of uses that phrase, the one who Jesus loved. That's how he defines himself. I'm the guy loved by Jesus. That's a great way to identify ourselves, right? But you have Simon Peter and John, who are going to go investigate this thing. And, and if you've been around me long enough to know, you, you've got to know, I love this line. Verse 3, At that, Peter and the other disciple went out, heading to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Again, one of those little details that helps you know that this is real people. I love that one. By the way, I outran Peter. Right? you got to love that. Peter gets to the tomb... Oh, but the other disciple outran him. You just got to love that because that, I mean, it, you guys, we understand that there's still that little bit of competition, right? Even on the first day, that Easter sunrise day, there's still that little bit. Oh, and yeah, I, I outran Peter that day. You got to just kind of think about that and kind of get that visual image in your mind. I love that. But they get to the tomb. Now, to give you that mental image of the tomb, what are we looking at? talked about that this morning you'd have this location probably like a like a like a like a cliff face or a hill or something and there would be these different tombs carved in it you actually purchase this piece of land and it would be like a family plot a family tomb people weren't sunk in the ground like we think of they were they would dig this cave and they would place a body normally as they're digging it out they dig a space where you'd place a body so this tomb would be sealed with a stone probably about this high Sometimes smaller, sometimes larger, but generally about this high, maybe three foot, four foot high, something like that. And it would be rolled. There'd be a channel where you could roll this in place to cover the tomb. This would have been what they considered like a graveyard, a site for these tombs. And there would have been, you know, maybe a dozen of these stones in place and different families would own them. And it would be plots for mom, dad, grandmas, grandpas, all, the whole family would be buried in the space. Now we recognize from elsewhere in the gospel writers, the tomb belonged to Joseph of Arimathea and it was a new tomb. No one had ever been there. It's a brand new tomb. He would have spent a, an amount, a certain amount of money on that. So we recognize this is not the tomb of a poor man. It's probably not even the tomb of a carpenter's son. This is the tomb of a rich man, which is an interesting idea. And at this moment, they place the body 
in the tomb. We recognize from the text, which we'll get to in a moment, he would have been wrapped in linen cloths, even a face cloth. There would have been this whole ceremony, weeping, people would go in, there would be prayers and laments and all of this. They would roll that stone in place and then we don't come back. We don't come back because the day prior is the Sabbath day, Saturday, and we do no work that day. But here the women decide to go and anoint the body. They're going to go and put spices and oils and things as a way of preservation and that type of stuff. But it was more an act of mourning. So they're sorrowful. We read that yesterday, or we read that this morning, the sorrow they're still upset. This is a, a thing that we're doing to just help ease the pain. But then, like we hear over and over in Scripture, remember we said how many times the tomb, the tomb, the tomb. There's something about this empty tomb that's amazing. Something about this empty tomb that speaks to the story, that speaks to the hope that we have today. The tomb is the key. They run to the tomb, verse 5, stooping down. They saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Following him, Simon Peter also came in. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been in his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up uh, in a separate pl place by itself. A lot of people, there's several different things, and maybe you've seen stuff on the internet about taking the napkin and folding the napkin because he's not done yet. I wouldn't read too much into that little statement. Just what we need to understand is the fact that the nap, not the napkin, the wrapping that was over his face would have just been that, like a small piece of cloth that was over his face. What you're supposed to make of the phrase that it was folded and placed off to the side, you're supposed to go, oh, not grave robbers. Grave robbers do not neatly fold up the cloths and put them there. Grave robbers take and run. We don't have time for all of that. If somebody's going to steal the body away while Roman soldiers are standing guard, you're not going to wait all that time. So again, a little piece of evidence, a little clue, this little wrapping that covered his head. There's something to it. It's just to show us that there was time taken. There was a moment. But it brings that big question. At what point is Jesus alive? I don't know if you've ever pondered that idea. What happens next in the story? He's in the grave then he comes back to life. There is some question, does it happen? Is this all one simultaneous moment in time? Matthew's gospel that we read this morning said there was an earthquake and the earthquake at the resurrection of Jesus as if the sun is rising up over the mountains and as if we could not wait another second. Boom, the earthquake, the angel, the stone as if it's all one continuous action, and it might have been. Did it happen early or later? We don't know. Here's what I do know, and we're going to explore this idea a little bit later. The stone was not rolled away to let Jesus out. Keep that in mind. The stone was not rolled away to let Jesus out. We recognize later in the story, in fact, we'll look a little bit next week at the epilogue of the story, but Jesus didn't even need that. The stone is rolled away to let someone in because the world has to know that he is not here. He is risen. You get that? The stone was not rolled away to let Jesus out. The stone was rolled away to let people see in and to verify and testify and their lives would be changed because the tomb is empty. That last part of that, verse 8, 8, 9, 10. The other disciple who reached the tomb first. Notice how he says that twice. I got there first, right? Y'all know that, right? Okay, he went in, saw and believed. 
And you got to love the way that that is written, right? He went in, he saw, he believed. That's our story, right? Like I said, the stone is rolled away to let people in. And when people come in, they can see. They can believe. That's the process that every one of us takes in this story. Someone rolls the stone away, meaning they unpack the story of faith for every one of us. We need to go into the story. We need to see for ourselves. And then we believe. For example, everybody's story is different. We recognize that. But we all have the moment when with the stone is rolled away, so to speak. Maybe there's a curiousness about what's there. The story of Jesus I'm talking about. Somebody, a friend may tell us the story. We go in and then we see for ourselves. We recognize that that's an act of faith. We recognize that that's an act of the Holy Spirit moving in someone's life. And we believe. I've talked about this one before, but faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. That's in Hebrews, right? That idea of belief, there's belief and there's belief, right? Like y'all can see me right now. I'm coming to you electronically. You believe that I am here in wherever I am. Most of you have no idea. A handful of you have maybe have been here. You know what this looks like. This is our dining area. On the other side of this wall is an office. Our kitchen is over there. You can't see those things, but by faith you believe. Belief is the key to the whole thing. When we think about this day, when we think about what the events that happened Friday, when we think about the suffering that Jesus did, when we think about dying, breathing his last, then being put in a tomb, there is belief and there is belief. Remember this morning I shared that story. Like I said, I got that from Philip Yancey that was part of Christianity Today and it was one of this, this editorial he wrote. Um, but somebody posed that question. A friend opened the tomb in a sense, told the story of her faith and she was shocked because the individual hearing it said, well, you don't live like you believe that. And it shocked her and it shocked her into a reality because that's the truth. And that's the truth of this day. Do we believe, as John believed, do we believe this to the point at which it affects our life? And I mean like daily. Because that's what the empty tomb is about. We go in, we see, we believe. That's the story, and that's what is the evidence that we find here in the story. Let me wrap this part up, and then i got a couple of important points. Four, verse 9, four, they did not yet understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. And you go, what? Jesus said it like four times at least, that he's going to die and be raised again. Isaiah is going to say it and, and recognize that, that passage, Isaiah 53, by his wounds, by his stripes, we're healed. It also says the light of life. He will see, he, he will die and then see the light of life. In other words, he will die and be raised again. But they don't quite get it yet. Verse 10, and then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. The tomb now is the thing that they looked and they saw and they believed and they were changed. The tomb has some really serious implications for you and I, and I want to share a couple of those with you. The first part of this one is you would say the empty tomb is theological. Our faith is based upon it. Our understanding of God is founded on it. I'll put this here at the bottom of the screen. Well, Peggy will put it at the bottom of the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. And if Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. Do not miss that one. 
According to the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, the empty tomb is absolutely, like I said, it's theological. It's part of our understanding of God. If you think about it, this entire book, the scriptures, all of it, from Genesis to Revelation, has been leading somewhere. And over and over and over again, you're getting this picture of death and life. Everything you can think of, there was nothing, and God breathed, and there was let there be light. And then there was life. There's the story. I don't know. I'm just pulling some of these that I could think of off the top of my head. There's that story of the whole earth is flooded, except for one man and his family and all these animals. And God is taking this life and raising it up over the death. Think about it. Noah's Ark, right? We think about later the, the nation of Israel. Things go along and things are going well and they end up, there's a famine in the land and this is going to mean death unless God brings life and he makes a way for one individual named Joseph and his coat of many colors, even though he's dead to his family, his brothers have sold him into slavery, he's alive. And his life is, is going to bring them life out of death. And they're going to go to Egypt. But wait, generations go by. There's a Pharaoh that doesn't know the story of Joseph any longer. They're slaves. In other words, as a people, they're dead. But God's going to bring this one Moses in the burning bush and the voice, I am. And we're going to see life come out of this dead people. See how this has been going throughout all of the scripture? That's just Genesis, right? And then into Exodus. Okay, Genesis into Exodus, right? But it continues. The story continues over and over and over. The story has always been death from life. And the Apostle Paul making this statement, okay, if Jesus had not made that step from death to life, your faith is worthless. That's a pretty heavy statement. If there is no Easter, if there is no Resurrection Sunday, if there is no empty tomb, then we have nothing to stand on. Our faith is worthless. So I'm telling you right now. And by the way, the Apostle Paul, if you want to read that for yourself, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, right? You read the rest of that when you go, The Apostle Paul is convinced, however, that Jesus Christ was very much alive. And why? Because he saw him. He knew. But there's more. Let me give you another verse. Once again, we'll put that down at the bottom of the screen. It's theological and it's foundational. Listen to this. This is 2 Corinthians, the next letter Paul writes. 2 Corinthians 4.14. For we know... Underline that one. For we know that the one who has raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you. Oh, it's foundational to everything we understand about the faith. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, we are dead. It is worthless if there is no empty tomb. Oh, and let's just hang on to something. 2 Corinthians, if there is no empty tomb, then none of us are getting raised. But again, read the rest of the story. The Apostle Paul, and I love it, for we know. The Apostle Paul is absolutely convinced that that stone is rolled away, that the tomb is empty. You go in, you see, you believe. And if that's not true, then nobody's going to be raised. And he continues on. But we know that people are. We know that it's true. It is our faith. It is foundational. Again, think of the depth of the tomb. And I'm not talking depth. I mean the depth theologically, foundationally, spiritually, the empty tomb. But wait, I got one more for you. And this one comes also from the writing of the Apostle Paul. This is Romans 8.11. Listen to this one. And if the spirit of him 
who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then you who raised Christ from the dead, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. Wait a minute, hold on. That line. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you? In me? Wait a minute, hold on. The power of the resurrection. Again, we read this morning, Matthew, earthquake, angel, shining clothes, stone rolled away. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, it lives in us as his followers. Oh, this is not only theological. It is not only foundational. This is powerful. Now, by the way, that is not to say we have that power like I personally can raise someone from the dead. Don't work that way. It's the power that lives in me. By the way, what's the power? The spirit who lives in you. The same power, the Holy Spirit power, that's what raised Jesus from the dead. And that spirit lives in me. My goodness. If that's true, what is stopping me? What could possibly stop me? What in the world is more powerful than that spirit that raised Jesus from the dead? Not a thing. And that's the spirit that lives in me. If I go in, I see, I believe. You get how this works? Go back to my statement. The stone is not rolled away to let Jesus out. The stone is rolled away to let people in. That they could go in and see and believe. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Belief is the key here. The empty tomb... The empty tomb is the evidence of my faith. It's the evidence of the foundation of the fact that I am not bound to this earth, that there is something more left in this next life. Oh, and by the way, it's also giving me the power of the Holy Spirit that resides in me. Now, if you could hear anything in those words, you should hear hope. All of these statements that I gave you it's about hope. I started this morning by telling you that's the key. And it is something that is so lacking in our world today. The, our hope does not come from the next election. Our hope does not come in the next time the economy comes back up again. Because obviously we're in this downturn and as the, the economy is going to come back up. And there is our hope. Our hope is not in the next job. Our hope is not in the next house. Our hope is not in the next car. Our hope is not in the next family member. Our hope is not in whatever on this earth that we place it in. Our hope is in the empty tomb. Our hope is found on Resurrection Sunday morning. Our hope is found in this story. In our world today, like I said, if we, we are in just such short supply because we're putting our hope in the wrong thing. Our hope needs to be squarely in the empty tomb and the risen Savior. There is no other name by which men can be saved except the mighty, powerful name of Jesus. The empty tomb proves, as the Apostle Paul said, it is the stamp of authority of who he is. If that tomb is not empty, then all you've got is a dead teacher prophet, whatever he was. And that has been the story for generations, right? Think of great teachers. Think of great people who claim to be speaking on behalf of God. And the one thing that separates all of them from Jesus is the empty tomb. There are great people, philosophers. There's even people today where you could go to their tomb and see where they lay but not Jesus. 
You cannot go to the city of Jerusalem today and find this cave system somewhere and go, okay, there's Jesus. Oh, there were some scholars about a decade back ago. Aha, look, we found them. We found this empty, we found this tomb, but it was full. And it happened to have this little bone box, this ossuary, and it says Jesus. And they go, aha, look, we found him. And next to him, Mary and another Joseph. Oh my goodness, we found him. This is it. No, you didn't. Because if you knew the story, you'd know that that's not our Jesus. There were other guys named Jesus in the Holy Land. It was a very common name. Our Jesus is not there. He is risen. He is risen indeed. That's the power of this day. And the evidence in the case for Easter. Yes, it is by faith. But yes, it is belief. We go in. The stone has been rolled away to let us in. We see Jesus and believe. Or we see Jesus who is not there. We see the empty tomb and believe. That's why I label this one the evidence for Christ. The evidence for Easter. The evidence is the empty tomb. That's a whole different thing. You could say now, you could get into a tour bus in the Holy Land and they'll take you to a place that they call the garden tomb. And it's empty. Then there's also a church built called the, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher where the empty tomb is supposed to have actually been. Don't know. Could be any one of those spots. You know what? It doesn't matter. Because the empty tomb says the most important thing in all of history. He is alive. A dead prophet, a dead teacher may have some great things, may have some important things, but it doesn't have the power. It doesn't have the foundation. It doesn't have the faith unless the tomb is empty. So what do we do with this? Where do we go from here? How do we understand this? How do we react to this? Number one, remember what I said. Does it change the way you live your life? Are you living like the tomb is empty and the Savior is real and risen and alive? Seriously. Seriously, think about it. Are you living your life like you know he is alive? Or we have this tendency to go, oh, it's coming. The risen Savior, he's alive and all, but in the sweet by and by, we will one day connect and it'll be cool and all that. Or are we literally saying that this empty tomb teaches us that Jesus is alive and active and real and at work and moving and powerful in our lives? Because seriously, if that were true, what could that do for our lives? Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying anything about wealth and fame. And that's not what Jesus is about. Never has been. But there is something, and we talked about that this morning, about purpose and plan and mission. If Jesus is alive, then we've got the purpose, the plan, and the mission. And it somehow fits into those words we read this morning, go and tell. Somehow, some way. Don't be afraid. Go and tell. Somehow it fits into that some way. And we have the power to do it because the Holy Spirit power is within us because the tomb is empty. So this morning, we are going to close it with a word of prayer. But I recognize that maybe somebody today were challenged by this in a, in, in a different way. Like maybe we're sitting here today and, you know, kind of thinking, wow, that's that's deep in my, my, my life. Is it, does it really reflect that? So maybe the prayer, when we have a moment of silence, and we'll take a moment of silence in our prayer, maybe the prayer for somebody today is, show me. Show me what area of my life I need to realign because you're alive. Maybe that's somebody's prayer this morning. Maybe you'd say, I feel kind of hopeless because of the situation that I'm in because of the diagnosis, because of the finances, because of whatever. I feel a little hopeless. I said this morning, and I'll add it again today, what if, 
you found hope because you had purpose and a plan and a mission. Because if the Holy Spirit is within us, then you do. Maybe this morning somebody's hearing this for the first time, which may even seem shocking to us. But yes, there are people in the world that have never heard the empty tomb story. There are never people that have thought about Jesus being alive. It's never crossed their mind before. But today it seems so real to you. Then during our prayer, you ask God what the next steps are for you. Maybe today we're feeling like, man, there's somebody else I know who needs to know the story. Lord, help me to share that as I can. Whatever it is, we're going to take this time of prayer and then I'm going to pause for a moment of silence. Whatever the Lord is saying to you, however you need to respond to the risen Savior, the living Jesus today. Imagine that he's standing right there in the room with you. What would you say? Use that time of silent prayer and say it. So let's go before him in prayer. Then I said silent prayer and then a couple of announcements at the end. But let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. I'm thanking you for the powerful message of Jesus that's found in the empty tomb. Such a deep thought that once was dead and now is a live Savior, that once was mourned, that women came and were going to anoint the body, but he is not here. He is risen. Changes their plans. Maybe it's the same for us today. Maybe you want to shift some of our plans too. I pray that you lead us and guide us today, that we understand that this is theological, foundational, and powerful. The empty tomb stands for all of those things today. But every one of us is maybe in a different place. Maybe there's some people today and there is the darkness and the hopelessness. But you want to flip that over. And you want to bring us into the light. You want to fill us with your spirit. Move us forward into your world in a new way. Maybe there's somebody today who this is all starting to click in their minds and you say, yes, it's time for me to follow Jesus fully with my life. Whatever the case may be, Lord, we are going to pause for a moment of silence before you. We're going to pause and just give it all back to you. What are you saying to each of us? We pause and take this moment of silence before you. Lord, I don't know what you're seeing in everybody's life today. Maybe there's somebody today who is at that place. They don't understand how it's all going to work out. They don't know how you're going to move in power in their lives. But we're trusting you. Believing in what you say. Believing that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is living in me. Maybe it's time that we get real about that. Maybe for somebody today, the message of the empty tomb is the message of a a life reborn, which is what they need. Maybe somebody today needs to take that step of faith that says yes to a renewed, reborn life. Maybe today is the day somebody takes that next step of faith. Maybe there's somebody with a diagnosis that needs to place it into your hands. Maybe there's somebody looking for the job and they don't know where it's going to come from and they need to put that in your hands. Maybe today there's somebody that is struggling with some kind of relationship issues that just has got them torn up 
and they need to place that into your hands. Whatever the case is, the empty tomb is there for us to go in and see and believe that you have it all. And you've done so much more than we know. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time to be connected as we are to whoever we're connected to today. And just believing that you want to take this message in, the, in just the next step in somebody's life. And we believe that and we trust in the empty tomb today. We thank you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And just a reminder, if today, if you feel as if the Lord has spoken to you in some way, and today is the day you need to say, okay, I surrender. I want to take the next step of faith. I want to draw nearer to Jesus today. I want to, yes, have my life be made new. I'm tired of the life that I'm living, and it's time for me to take the next step. We believe just that thought means that you are alive. And that's why we put this on the screen down below. You just text the word alive to that 800 number, 888-2430-827. You text the word alive, and it's going to kick you back this automatic, this PDF file. Nobody's going to bug you. It's just between you and God at this moment, right? You, in that text, it's going to be sent back to you. There's this PDF file with the Gospel of John, what we've been just reading. But then also, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to live as if the empty tomb is really empty? All of that's found in that little book. Text the word alive to that number. Also, we believe that this happens together in community. And yes, we're an online community of faith. We have other opportunities for you to get connected, be a part of the community. The next time that we're going to get together is on Tuesday. We're talking about from the book of Romans, which was the last quote. The book of Romans has the essentials. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? The essentials are in Romans, and we're going through that as we have been for a couple of weeks. And you can join us here, YouTube, Facebook, and also on Zoom. Also have just a little morning encouragement on Friday mornings. I'm live on the radio in a couple of different cities, and you can join us. We put the link on Facebook. That's Fridays at 8 o'clock in the morning. Again, all these times Pacific time. You can join us for that one. And then later in the evening, we have a Bible study, a little more interactive time than what we do on Sundays. But you can join us at 7 o'clock in the evening Pacific time for another Bible study. Ask questions, get answers. That's a great time for that. We're calling that one Jesus Is. And that's the theme in the book of Hebrews. Jesus Is. Jesus is what? Well, you got to join us to find out. And then we are back here again. I want to continue, like I said, the epilogue. There are a couple of more stories, but one more story I want to share in particular, the rest of the story, at least in the case of one of the disciples. We're going to look at that next week as we continue Jesus' at the same time, 10 o'clock Pacific time right here. No sunrise next week, okay? We're not doing that one for another year, okay? Sunrise service. It was great this morning. If you didn't catch it, watch it. It fits together so well with this message this morning. Somehow, some way, you can get connected with us. We also say we are a church like every other church in the world that is dependent on the people giving, being generous in giving. We can't do this unless people give to allow us to do this. So to give, we've made it really easy. We're an electronic church and we've got electronic giving. You can text the word give to that 888-2430-827. That will link you back to our website. You could just go to the website, churchonline.com, C-H-R-C-H, churchonline.com, click the give tab and you can give. We say invest in what we are doing. You invest in church online. You put your money in believing that there is a return there. You're investing on what God is doing through this incredible online ministry that he has given us. And we just thank you for all those that do give and praying that more will give. And we just thank everybody that's been a partner in this ministry. We thank you for that. So until then, just reminding you, he is risen. He is risen indeed. You have a great rest of your Sunday.